song we just said about never forsaking the Lord should be the desire for each and every one of us. And yet, we know that there are entanglements that we can fall into that cause us to forsake Him. Uh, we are to trust our God, put all of our trust in Him, but sometimes the entanglements of this world cause us to put our trust in things other than God. Pharaoh, in the long ago, when the children of Israel were released after the ten plagues, thought the Israelites would be entangled in the land and that the wilderness would shut them in, Exodus 14 and verse 3, and thus he expected to be able to go in and get them and make them return to the slavery that he had placed them under. Satan has his devices as uh, Paul would write in St. Corinthians 2 and verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage over us, or of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan is trying to get an advantage over us. Uh, and he has the tricks, the devices that he's going to use in order to accomplish that. Uh, Paul talks about the snare of the devil. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 26, uh, that they may recover themselves <coughs> to, out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Thus, Satan is trying to ensnare us, take us captive according to his will, by the devices, the snares that he's going to use. The entanglements with the affairs of this life is one of the things that Satan uses uh, to entangle us in his snares and thus give, get an advantage over us. We looked at uh, the scriptures warning us against such and looked at a few of those entanglements of this world, like the love of wealth, sinful occupations, uh, making God or wisdom a God, rather than learning the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God uh, that comes from the Scriptures. And we can always become, and we see this more and more, especially with young people, uh, making an entanglement of debts in which they become so indebted to others that their entire life is trying to pay off bills. And that is why we see so many bankruptcies in our society because young people in particular don't know how to handle that money because they just charge this, charge that, charge everything else, and then they become so entangled with debt that they can't get out of it. But also another entanglement that Peter talks about is the pollutions of the world. St. Peter 2 and verse 20 uh, through 22, where he talks about, uh, for if after they... <coughs> They have escaped the pollutions of, this, of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are entangled again and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them again, or it happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. He talks about the pollutions of the world. Well, that's the people that are in the world. They are, <coughs> they are subject to, they are engaged in those pollutions of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and all of the various facets that those three terms cover. Well, 
here's individuals that were engaged in that. They came out of it. They escaped it. They became Christians. But then they are entangled again with those pollutions of the world. And they're overcome as a result of those pollutions of the world. And the result is their latter end is worse than the beginning. The beginning point was that they were lost. And here is a condition that is worse now because they had known the way of righteousness. And they left that way of righteousness to go back into the pollutions of the world. We are to live separated lives. We are to, as Paul mentions, come out from among them and be separate in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17, so that the Lord will receive us and be our Father and we can be His sons and daughters. We are to not be conformed to this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. We begin <coughs> with some of the pollutions of the world would be drinking and drunkenness. Solomon would write in the long ago that wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 20 and verse 1. In our society today, though, drinking alcoholic beverages, and we're talking about beverage alcohol, is so commonplace that it almost is you're looked at as strange if you don't engage in drinking. That seems to be all that some people drink is beverage alcohol. They have become entangled with that beverage. Now we're not talking about, when we're talking about beverage alcohol, we're not talking about medical usage. We recognize that, yes, from a medical standpoint, alcohol can be used and is oftentimes used in many medications. It helps the other medications to be absorbed into the system in a more efficient and a better way, a faster way. And so many times other medications will be combined with alcohol to improve that medication's effect upon the individual. Alcohol itself can be a medical and have medical effects. Paul commanded Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake and his oft infirmities. Why? Because he had oft infirmities and that wine would help. Now we would add in that passage in relationship to Timothy, that does not necessarily mean alcoholic wine. Wine in the Bible, usage of the term, is a general term that can embrace anything from the juice that is still in the grape all of the way until you get to the alcoholic aspect. And so it, it, the juice that's in the grape is wine. Grape juice is wine. Alcoholic beverage, wine. All of them embraced under that broad term using wine. Now then, we don't, in our society, we don't use the term wine like that. When we use the word wine, we're using alcoholic beverage. That may not be as strong as other alcoholic beverages, but it's still an alcoholic beverage. We don't use it for the juice that's in the grape, still, or grape juice. But the Bible does. So we not, need to understand when it says wine, that does not necessarily mean alcohol. Now then, it might have been. We would not argue against the use of alcoholic medication. Just like 
when the Bible commands us to be sober-minded and yet using drugs that cause us not to be sober-minded. We don't have difficulty with that. It's when, and so we're not dealing with it from a medical standpoint now, we're dealing with it from a beverage standpoint. Drinking alcohol as a beverage. And that's what Solomon is saying. It's a mocker. It's raging. You're deceived by it. And thus not wise. Proverbs 23rd chapter. Solomon discusses it again. In fact, it's discussed many times in the book of Proverbs. But verses 29 through verse 35 of Proverbs 23 is an extensive dealing with the aspect of drinking alcohol. When he asks the question, <coughs> he begins by asking the question, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? Now then, look at the answer. They that tarry long at wine, they that go to sick, seek mixed drink, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes should behold uh, strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have have stricken me, that sh uh, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Now, doesn't that sound like well, alcoholics today? But notice, he says, don't even look upon wine, beverage, alcohol. Some members of the church, sadly, will defend drinking alcoholic beverage as long as you don't get drunk, they say. Bible condemns drunkenness. Well, here it says, don't even look upon it. Now, I've never had one answer in relationship to say, I guess that means you can drink it as long as you close your eyes so that you don't have to look upon it. Now, he tells us don't look upon it, but they're saying we can drink it. So, I guess drink it without, with your eyes closed. That's going to make it all right. I, say, I don't know of anyone who's ever answered that. But yet, that's the position that they take. Don't look on it. The effects of it are going to lead to wickedness and sin. We become enslaved to alcoholism. How many alcoholics do we have in our society? In Ephesians 5 and verse 18, we really probably ought to go back to Ephesians 5 and verse 17 because that's really where this begins. When he says, Wherefore be not under unwise but understanding what the Lord is, will of the Lord is and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess but be filled with the spirit and then he goes on speaking to yourselves in psalms hymns spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God now, I read on through verse 21 for a reason. While verse 18 is the one that we want to center upon, to be not drunk with wine wherein is, in is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. There is a command that is set forth here. The command, it's an imperative in the original Greek, 
is to be filled with the Spirit. There are five participles, present participles, that are used in relationship in a present participle denotes two things. One, action that is contemporary with what the command is, in this case being filled with the Spirit. And two, action that results from and evidencing being filled with the Spirit or the action of the, ver the command here, being filled with the Spirit. So it's contemporary with and it results from being filled with the Spirit. What are those five present participles? Speaking, in the phrase speaking to yourselves. Singing. The third is making melody. The fourth is giving thanks. And the fifth is submitting. You can see those present participles in, in the King James by the ING endings <laughs> uh, in this context. Now then, he, but he makes a, a contrast here. One is being filled with the Spirit. The other one is being drunk with wine. In the original Greek, there's a way in which you make a word, and in, it's called inceptive. There's other terms, uh, cohative. Uh, phrase it means to begin the process the Greek word that's translated drunk here is methusko he could have used methuo which would be drunkenness when he uses though the ending S-K-O, from Matthew to Matthew Scope. The S-K-O ending in a verb automatically makes it an inceptive verb. That's why, uh, for example, uh, there's several that have uh, stated this, but... Um, Vine puts it uh, that it's an inceptive verb. It is by its nature. Now then, when you're dealing with an inceptive verb, you're dealing with beginning the process. Here's the beginning point, and that's what is being stressed. Here's the beginning of being drunk with wine. And he says, do not begin the process of being drunk with wine. The question then comes in reality. The, how does one begin the process? Or you might put, enter into the process. It's the entrance into this action. That's what an inceptive verb is. Entrance into the action. How do you enter into being drunk with wine? There's only one way, really. And that's when you start drinking. <laughs> drinking alcohol. That's when you begin the process. That's when you're entering into it. And Paul clearly, succinctly states, do not do it. He's saying, it's not simply saying, don't get drunk in this case, but he is stating, do not enter into the process that starts you to get drunk. That's the meaning of it, because that is put in opposition to being filled with the Spirit. You can either be filled with the Spirit, and those participles that show and evidence being filled with the Spirit, or you can start this process of becoming drunk with wine. 
those are the two options that you have there. If you start that process of becoming drunk with wine, then you're not going to be filled with the Spirit. If you're going to be filled with the Spirit, then you're not going to start that process even of becoming drunk with wine. In other words, you're not going to enter into that situation where you drink even one drink of beverage alcohol. And yet, it is so common within our society that it is almost expected today by everyone. Drunkenness, and yes, drinking beverage alcohol, is a great pollution of this world that entangles us into it to where we become where it is habit forming so that we cannot get out of it or it becomes extremely difficult to and thus we have all of these organizations today to try and help us to get out of that situation why because people have become entangled in that sin but another entanglement of this world is, deals with our speech one of those areas certainly would be lying. Paul would write in Ephesians 4 and verse 25, Wherefore, wherefore put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. We are not to lie. Simple as that. In fact, all lies are Satan. John 8 and verse 44 says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father he ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and gnosis, he abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. If you speak a lie, you're of Satan. Just that simple. And that's what Jesus is saying. He is the father of lies. Why? Because there's no truth in him, and so he is a liar. And when he speaks a lie, he's speaking of his own. He's not speaking of the things of God. When we lie, we're speaking of the things of Satan, not of the things of God. God is always and always has been a God of truth not a God of lies. God never lies because it is contrary to his nature. And just as an aside, a lot of times people will say, well, God can do anything. No, he can't. God cannot do anything. God cannot do anything that is contrary to his nature. It's an impossibility for God to lie. Why? Because it is contrary to his nature. It is impossible for God to sin. Why? Because it is contrary to his nature. If God could lie, then what confidence would anyone have of anything that God says? God says you have to obey the gospel to have the forgiveness of sins. But did he tell us the truth? It might be a lie if he can lie. God says, don't do this, or don't do that, or you must do this, or you must do that. How do you know if God can lie? If God has the ability to lie, how do you know if you do this that God says don't do that you're actually going to displease him? How do you know if you do not do that which God says to do? If you're just going to say, well, that's all right. I was lying about it anyway. You see, we can have absolutely no confidence and no hope in God if God is a liar. That's why he is always spoken of as a God of truth. Satan, on the other hand, is the opposite of that. 
He is a liar and the father of lies. So if we're going to be godly, if we're going to partake of God's divine nature, we cannot lie. Because any time we tell any lie, then we are of Satan and not of God. And we're taking part of Satan and following Satan and his will. Again, how many times in our society, though, do we face those aspects of people lying? How many people call into work, for example, on a daily basis? Oh, I'm sick. When in reality they're not sick, they're going to go someplace else or do something else. And they just want out of work. So, so I'm sick today. They lied. They're Satan. How many times uh, growing up are children taught to lie by so-and-so calls and the child answers? It's so-and-so on the phone. Well, tell them I'm not here. <laughs> well, we've lied. We've taught them to lie also, and that lying is acceptable. Now, let's make a distinction, though, between telling a lie and telling a falsehood. Sometimes we state falsehoods that are not lies. Simply because we say something that is false does not make it a lie. I can honestly, sincerely state something that is false. I'm a, in that case, I would not know that it is false. I would think that it is true. But in reality, it's false. I've told a falsehood, but I'm not lied. Lying is involved when there is an intentional telling of a falsehood. I know it to be false. I am presenting it as truth, even though I know it's not true. That's when we see what lying is. Oftentimes we use lying also in a loose way of withholding information. Not telling all the truth. If you don't tell all the truth, then you lied. No, you didn't. Not necessarily. If you take that view, you're going to have some difficulties with God. Because God told uh, Samuel the prophet to tell Saul one thing when it was not all of the truth. Samuel was going to go... Uh, crowned David to be king. And he recognized if Saul finds out about it, he'll kill me. And God says, tell him you're going to sacrifice. Samuel was going to sacrifice. It was the truth. But he did not tell him all of the truth as to why he was going. He withheld certain information from Saul because Saul did not have a right to that information. But he did not lie by withholding that information. God basically told him, don't tell him. So simply because information is withheld is not necessarily a lie. Now if that information is needed... If, that, if failure to give that information is going to cause someone to act in a certain way that is contrary to God's will, or they're going to act in a way that they should not be acting, then we have an obligation to tell them that information. In the situation with Samuel and Saul, Saul would have acted in such a way that would have been contrary to the will of God, so he did not have a right to that information. There's the difference that needs to be understood in understanding with the withholding of information. But when we know something is intentionally 
and we tell it as true, and we know it is intentionally false, then we are lying. And God says that all liars are going to be lost. Look at Revelation 21 and verse 27, that there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth or whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. In Revelation 22 and verse 15, he again emphasizes, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Those individuals are without. They're not a part of the kingdom of God. They're not a part of the Lord's church. They're not going to be a part of heaven. They're without. They're outside. They are with those whoremongers and murderers. The idolaters, people who lie. Truth is important, and people need to be able to rely upon what we say. But there's another aspect of speech, and that is vile, filthy speech. Paul would express it in in Ephesians uh, 4 and verse 29, to let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that he may minister grace to the hearers. Corrupt communication. Communication that is simply vile, that is filthy, that is corrupt. Uh, In writing to the Colossian brethren, chapter 3 and verse 8 and 9, he again emphasizes the same thing when he says, But now ye also put off all these, anger, (coughs) wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. So not only lying is to be put off, but also filthy communication. Speech that is evil, that is wicked, that is non-productive, that is vile language and speech. The Christian sh- should speak in a way that would be edifying to others, not tearing them down. The attitude of so many that, well, I just say whatever comes out of my mouth or whatever I think is not the attitude of the Christian. The Christian thinks before he speaks. The Christian is going to make sure that he doesn't just say any old thing that comes into his mind, but he's going to use and withhold those things that are vile and wicked, and he's going to say those things that are good and profitable. And thus the the world should be able to recognize a Christian by the way that they speak. Their talk, everyday life. They're not going to be talking about things that really uh, should not be talked about as far as even though the world considers nothing of them. Christian speech should be above that to where it's going to help, not degrade. Anger and evil speaking also needs to be put away from us. Again, in Ephesians 4 and verse 31, where he says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So here's evil speaking. And he listed in relationship to bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. And then he adds malice again afterwards. So he's dealing with an evil speaking that deals with these type of attitudes that one might possess. We should not, as Christians, possess those type of attitudes and allow it to come through in our speech. Again, in Peter, in 1 Peter 2 and verse 1, says, Wherefore, laying apart all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings. Put those things away. That's not part of the Christian speech. The Christian speaks different than the world. Jesus would state in Matthew 12 
verse 36 and 37. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Jesus places, at least in this context, our eternal destiny based upon our speech. We're going to spend eternity in heaven or we're going to spend eternity in hell based upon what we say. We need to make sure thus that we're not speaking as he uses idle speech, idle words, but we need to be using those words that will be of profit, that will build up, that will strengthen people, that will make things better and not worse. Not evil speaking, not gutter or vil filthy, vile language. Not lying. But then one other, and very briefly this afternoon, and that's theft and de dishonesty. In Ephesians 4 and verse 28 and 29, Paul would say, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the things which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. I can remember many times in joking around with others that people would use this uh, and put the wrong pun punctuation to it. Let him steal, steal. And then they would leave out a couple of words. No more working with his hands. Or no more labor working with his hands. Well, that's the attitude, it seems, of a lot of people. Go ahead and steal. Go ahead and take things that really don't belong to us. And it can be done in many and various ways. When we, yes, take something that doesn't belong to us, we have stolen it. It's dishonest. When we don't do that which we say we're going to do in our work, we're dishonest. When we become slackers in our work, especially if we're working for a company and we decide, well, we won't, you know, uh, we don't really have to do all this hard work and hard labor. We'll just take it easy and get by and they won't do anything about it anyway. Or as, uh, you know, they've got all of this material, they won't miss this. That's stealing, that's dishonesty. We need to be honest. Yes, that means giving a hard day's labor for that which we get paid for. But misrepresenting things to others to gain an advantage is stealing. It's theft. If I have a car out here that I'm going to sell, and I misrepresent the things in that car, Maybe it's an old clunker. Maybe the engine's going or it has this problem or that problem. And I represent, there's not a bit of problem that runs just fine. Not only is that lying, it's stealing. When we take that money. We need to be honest in our dealings with others. Not misrepresenting because that's, yes, theft. It's stealing as far as God is concerned. We can be entangled in those things because these things are all around us. It's things that the world do, does. I remember my dad, when he went into the business world and specifically real estate, he was told by many, unless you give money under the table to these people, you're never going to make it in real estate. In other words, you take extra money for work done, and then you give a little bit of money to, and you can keep a little bit extra, and that way we both make a little bit extra money, and you steal from the other person, because that's what that is. 
And he was told, unless you do that, you'll never make it in real estate. When you do those things, though, the Christian will not do them because he is a Christian. A Christian will be honest with people, deal honestly with them, and not try and steal from them. But I use that as an illustration. It's expected many times among our, the people that we live with and we associate with. But that's not the way of the Christian. It's easy to become entangled with those things, even though we are Christians. But when we are entangled with them, we sin and we separate ourselves from God. There's a remedy for that, of course, and that is repentance. True repentance, and turning away from those evil things that we are doing to turn to God in God's appointed way, praying to God for our forgiveness of our sins. So if there is sin within your life this afternoon, we would encourage you to obey that truth as to coming back and being restored to faithfulness to God. If you never become a Christian, then you need to obey that truth of God's Word. Why? Because He says to do it, and we can trust Him. And He's not going to lie to us. He's told us the truth about having the forgiveness of our sins. So if we want the forgiveness of our sins and we want to spend an eternity with God in heaven, then we have to do those things that he says. That in becoming a Christian, in remaining a Christian, and if we become entangled with the affairs and the pollutions of this world, then repenting of our sins and praying to him, and we can have that home with God in heaven. Why? Because we can trust God in what he says. So if you need to do that this afternoon, we would encourage you to come to make things right with God through this and save your soul. If you need to, won't you come as we stand and sing the invitation song?